welcome and thank you for coming today to this little music assisted presentation on Paul Robeson called Paul's Song Revisited. How do we remember Robeson? In a culture that thrives on sports stars and movie stars, Paul Robeson was an entire constellation. He's like Orion's belt. He was an all time All American football star, film star, recording star, political giant. He was even a star attorney who both defended the head of the American Communist Party and himself against Senator McCarthy's un-American activities hearings. Paul Robeson was a giant like Hiawatha, but nobody could have made him up. For me growing up, Robeson was already a legend bigger than Paul Bunyan. He was the inspiration for me through my whole growing up, and perhaps the model that most shaped my life. As a kid in the 50s and 60s, I was told never to speak his name in public because it could get our family into trouble. My father had already lost one job because of some bureaucrats misplaced patriotism and rampant fears of closet communists infiltrating society. So, in the 1980s, after the Berlin Wall fell and I started talking about Robeson, I was astounded anyone under 30, even my educated black friends, didn't know his name. And people who did know his name only knew of all the false rumors and propaganda that had been made up about him that he lived in Russia, which he hadn't, that he was a communist, which he wasn't. And of course, anyone who knew differently kept their mouth shut. In 1991, I wrote this musical dialogue called Paul's Song, which you have on your covers there. It had songs of my own that represented what the thought of Paul Robeson said to me. It was also full of pictures and clips of him singing his own songs and was designed so that three college students could bring Paul Robeson's story to public classrooms. For kids could use a giant, a superhero from real life, as well as a couple kids from college to look up to. Naturally, in 1991, Robeson's name was still not back in circulation. So even with $1,000 that a friend of mine gave me for publicity and mailings, with posters and songs to every college drama department in the country, uh, Paul's song died unborn. When my significant other asked me what I wanted to do for my 60th birthday, I decided to have another shot at it. I didn't want the songs to die or the inspiration. But now Paul Robeson means something very different to me, and there's a different reason, a more pressing reason, why we need to remember him. The easy part of this story is about his growing up. Young Robeson. How he took two tests in the time given for one. He went for a scholarship test and they, somebody hadn't told him there was a prerequisite test that he had to take first. So he said, well, I'll take both of them. He got the highest rank in the state, got his scholarship to Rutgers. Then because he played football at Somerville football, at high school, I mean, uh, he was on Rutgers football team the rest of the team decided to cleat him, beat him up during practice, cleated his hands, his face. His dad told him, he learned from his dad not to fight back, just to keep playing. So he kept playing and Rutgers won the championship three years in a row and he of course was their star player. Then when he graduated from Rutgers, he played pro football, pro baseball, black leagues, of course, to put himself through Columbia Law School. When he became a lawyer, he went to Manhattan. The secretaries wouldn't take dictation from him. So he figured, well, I'm not going to work with these people. So he was already playing at the Cotton Club. So he became a famous singer, actor up there, and went over to England. and. Uh, became a film star. This is the story any kid can gobble up. I mean, it's American myth. Story about how he idolized his dad. Pop Robeson was an upstanding, important man in Princeton. He was the minister of the Second Presbyterian Church until he spoke at a Philadelphia rally against lynchings. And then Reverend Robeson was barred from his post by the White Presbytery. He ate humble pie, they stayed in Princeton, he became the Ash Man, and he was a cab driver. He used to drive fraternity boys around. It's right out of a vintage Hollywood film. Pop Robeson was Paul Robeson's real hero. And, I mean, he was a hero. I mean, he 
been an ex-slave, fought, fought with the Union Army after he escaped, and then got himself educated and became a minister. I mean, this Pop Robeson was pretty something. Paul Robeson, of course, followed up on him. Paul Robeson's dream of human rights for all people, black and white, worker and tenant farmer, peasant and poor around the world, earned him, of all things, a national holiday in India and a mountain in Russia. His fight for the cause of justice is something that any small child could identify with. F small children are all bewildered by the horror of the world around. The small child in all of us still wants to put its hands around some kind of struggle against injustice. It's about this, this Paul Robeson, in my play that I wrote this song. It's called, What's the Question? There's a hole in the bottom of the sea. There's a hole in the bottom of the sea. There's a hole. There's a hole. There's a hole in the bottom of the sea. And I don't know why and I don't know where. But I swear it's gonna be the death, the death of me. Gonna plug it with my body when I get it there. I say fears an iron mountain reflect in men's eyes And I know just how, and I know just why And my fingernails will bite into that mountain in the sky Gonna rip it, gonna drag it till I die What's the question? I don't know Million souls are crushed for answers. No suggestions from below. Life is stifled still. What's the reason? I don't know. Million souls are crushed at random. Watch the trees a bubble show. Liberty lies still. Long's the time that symbols dwell in the sands of propaganda, molding words to silent sense, casting minds to kill. What's the power to corrupt? Is it ego? Is it pleasure? Social spirits so bankrupt to act against our will. I say fears in iron mountain reflect in men's eyes, and I know just how, and I know just why, and my fingernails will bite into that mountain in the sky, gonna rip it, gonna drag it till I die, gonna rip it, gonna drag it till I die. The second part of Robeson's story is harder to understand. It's the story of how Paul Robeson was destroyed. Coretta King once said, they shot my husband, but they buried Paul Robeson alive. He was never allowed to rip it or drag it till he died. In 1954, he published his own book, Here I Stand with His Own Money. No publishers or major book distributors would take this book. No major papers would review it or advertise it. But it was sold out almost immediately by word of mouth. Let me take a step back. By the 1930s, Paul had become a star in the British film industry. Hollywood wouldn't produce films featuring a Negro star, but England would. Paul was already famous as the a great Shakespearean actor in London as Othello. In 1937, when fascism was growing in Europe, he threw over his film career to focus on political causes of justice and freedom. In those days, he was traveling all around the world with his firebrand wife, Essie, fighting against European and corporate colonialism. Interesting, of course, he was famous in England, he was on the English stage, he was in English films, 
He was fighting against British colonialism in Africa, in India, and the Far East. And let me add here, there's no story of Paul that can leave Essie out. Most stories generally do leave Essie out. But there's another couple um, named Bill and Hillary that come to mind. Uh, Essie's a story for a whole different musical. I mean, she was amazing. She met Paul when he was still going uh, to Columbia Law School and he broke a leg. And she was already the first black doctor at uh, New York Hospital. Anyway. Back in the U.S., in 1938, his broadcast, Ballad for Americans, was heard by more people coast to coast than any radio show except right after that, War of the Worlds. Paul performed it representing, I mean, performed Ballad of Americans, representing one of our great patriots and international statesmen, leading this country as a bulwark of freedom in the world being overrun by fascism. But right after the war, Black servicemen who had fought for the cause of freedom in the Pacific and North Africa were coming back to a Jim Crow America as second-class citizens. The equality they'd seen in the U.S. Army, or at least partial equality they, didn't, they saw in the Army, didn't exist when they got home. In the South especially, tensions mounted and lynchings and beatings of uppity black servicemen became more than commonplace. So Paul organized a rally in Washington along with W.E.B. Du Bois. The NAACP by this time was holding Robeson at arm's length in 1948. Robeson and Du Bois went to met, meet with President Truman. And Robeson came right out and told the president if he didn't speak out in support of an anti-lynching bill, American Negroes would have to arm themselves and put a stop to it. Truman ended the interview right then and there. Robeson told the press gathered outside on the White House lawn, and two weeks later, Paul Robeson was called to testify at an un-American activities hearing in California. In 10 short years, he had come from being number one patriot to number one, public enemy number one. And it's interesting, the turning point in his career was just like his pops. Now, of course, there was the well-known communist sympathies. His speech at the Paris Peace Conference in 1949, where he said American Negro boys shouldn't go to war against nations which respected all cultures and peoples, meaning the Soviet Union and China. He was an anathema to the American system. And he took up the fight with a vengeance against the same kind of anti-communist rabble-rousing that had given Europe over to fascism only 20 years before. Besides, in the U.S., he was fighting bigotry on a wider front, for racism with segregated theaters, stores, public bathrooms, and water fountains was even less thinly disguised than in Germany before the war. His passport was taken, and his public career was ended. Theaters were threatened. His concerts were shut down. There were riots run by bigots and super patriots. His name and picture were stripped out of sports records. Anyone who associated with him or spoke his name became suspect. He became America's first non-person. When he published Here I Stand, with what was left of his money in 54, everyone held him at arm's length. As I said, the NAACP had nothing to do with him for years. But still, everybody bought his book and didn't say a word. Here I Stand, by the way, is a quote from the original Martin Luther when he refused to recant his words before the Pope, and he was excommunicated from the world as it then existed. How does somebody tell this story? And who can own up to it? And worse, if we believe it, how do we process it into something meaningful? Here's a song I had my play for ropes in The Freedom Fighter. It's an angry song with a Spanish flavor, recalling Paul's visit to the international troops defending the Spanish democracy against the fascist takeover in 37. It's called Tango to War. <clears throat> Paper speak, radio speak, all the news they think is truth to hear for our ears. Question not what's under the meaning. 
Editors in their little offices giving truth a screening. Squads of youth, their chromium steel plate, belching flesh a blood slickened meal, chewing up a quiet dreaming village. Vitamins of war are real. Hand me my tools, I'm gonna build the caskets for wide-eyed children. Cover the graves already filled with parents, their hatred quenched. Hand me down my textbooks for farms I'm gonna see resistant to germs of hunger. Study the laziness and greed that makes simple folk want blood. Hand me down my tools, for we must Tools to rebuild. What tools? I said earlier I look at him differently now. Today I associate him with the great dream and the great disappointment of progressivism. Robeson represented faith in a world of justice. He represented it simply through the tone of his voice and also with his bearing and stature. It's the voice I heard on old 78 RPM records as a kid. Songs like Old Man River, Joe Hill, the four insurgent generals, but mostly what he sang were spirituals. Paul Robeson was the first person to give a concert devoted to spirituals or to record them. And he was singing of working and dreaming for a just world here on earth, not a glory hallelujah promised land in the hereafter. This was the utopianism of the Owenites, the commutarian Fourier phalanxes of the 1850s. Even the infamous John Brown represents the utopian spirit in 19th century America. This was, in fact, the legacy of Puritans and the Calvinist Presbyterians, where Paul's father had been a minister. I have here an introduction to a book called Looking Backward by Eric Fromm, where he's discussing uh, the utopian uh, we, Utopianism. He's discussing Judeo-Christian tradition behind the concept of utopia. And this is important here. If I find the right page. Utopia is a society in which man has reached such perfection that he's able to build a social system based on justice, reason, and solidarity. The beginning and the basis of this vision lie in the messianic concept of the Old Testament prophets. The essential idea of this concept is that man, after losing his primary and pre-individual unity with nature and with his fellow man, as symbolically expressed in the story of the fall and expulsion, he begins to make his own history. His act of disobedience was his first act of freedom. He becomes aware of himself as a separate individual and his separation from nature and from all other men. Such awareness is the beginning of history, but history has an aim and a goal. That man, driven by the longing for renewed union with nature and with man, will develop his human faculties of love and reason so fully that eventually he attains a new union, a new harmony with nature and with man. He will then no longer feel separate, alone, and isolated, but will experience his atonement, atonement with the world in which he lives, and he will feel himself truly at home and no longer a stranger in the world. The prophetic idea is that man makes his own history. Neither God nor the Messiah changes nature or saves him. He himself grows, unfolds, and becomes what he potentially is. Robeson wasn't destroyed because he wasn't strong enough for the fight. It wasn't the dream. Rather, it was because he was called on to defend partial answers, movements that were somehow already flawed from the start. 
Striking out against bigotry and ignorance, he found himself backed into a corner, backing up a communism he couldn't really defend. Fromm was a psychologist, and in the same introduction, I found that he had asked the question that had gone unanswered for me as a child. Why had every progressive and liberal been called a communist? What had gone wrong? Why had the dream been bankrupt? In this piece on Bellamy, Fromm puts his finger on the Achilles heel of the entire progressive movement, which in Bellamy's progressive party was one wing of 19th century socialism. I'll read it from here. Incidentally, Bellamy's party was called National Socialist. It was an American party. What happened to socialism? Instead of understanding it as a movement for the liberation of man, many of its adherents and its enemies alike understood it as being exclusively a movement for the economic improvement of the working class. The humanistic aims of socialism were forgotten or only played, paid lip service to, as in capitalism. All the emphasis was laid on the aims of economic gain. It succumbed to the spirit of capitalism which it had wanted to replace. It became the vehicle by which the workers could attain their place within the capitalistic structure rather than transcend it. And instead of changing capitalism, socialism was absorbed by its spirit. At least to me, that answered my question. Well, they say hope springs eternal. And even if we haven't thought through what we hope for, it springs eternal no matter what. But if it's not for more just material distribution of wealth, <clears throat> what could we be hoping for? Hmm. I think I hear some hope bubbling up right now. When you got strength, gotta go to any length, gotta use what you got to unravel the knots. Standing proud, gonna sing out loud that the old human spirit's got hope. Outsource me and I guarantee that some jerk will prove you're working more efficiently. Accountant never lies, so your stock is bound to rise to support the economy. Why it's utopia, we all agree, our needs can all be met. By technology, cause system knows it all, it's got us up against the wall to support a little tyranny. Yavol! All we see, a new century, where emotions are life's notions borrowed from TV. Addict us to our soaps, wash our minds until we're dopes, and we'll tell you it's democracy. If your mind has still got strength, gotta go to any length to uncover the rot, whether they like it or not. Standing proud, gonna sing out loud that the old human spirit still got hope, and the humanistic spirits still got hope. Yeah, that was a fun one. <laughs> When Paul gave his 1919 valedictorian address at Rutgers for his graduating class, obviously, it was full of the spirit of hope in a bright new future and perhaps a hundred years ahead of its time. The theoretical excitement that had burst on the industrial age at the end of the previous century made it appear that real tools, a new science of society, was around the corner. Paul Robeson was caught up in that hope. <clears throat> There's a cute little book from 1913. It's called The New Basis of Civilization by a fellow named Patton, Simon Patton, who happened to be the dean of Wharton School of Economics at Penn University of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, he talks about a future of credit cards and recreation where all the workers live to do recreational endeavors and thus pump up the economy. It's about today. 1913. Anyway. Paul Robeson was caught up in the hope. What he couldn't realize was that the tools to make the hopes of his 1919 address didn't actually exist yet. What most of us fail to realize is that they still don't. When he was growing up, economics was a popular subject, open to all kinds of discussion and creative opinion. Economics was part of the birthright of any child born to an opinionated and talkative family dinner table. If you consider that Henry Adams could write about the giant Westinghouse steam turbine at the World's Fair of 1892, just several paragraphs after talking about the world of his grandfather and great-grandfather, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, you can begin to understand the rate of change the world had seen in a few brief years. During all that time, from the physiocrats of old Bourbon France and Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, is Adam Smith. That's my father's old copy. An entirely new, an entire new science of society was being born. And with technology all around, there was a great faith in that science. But by the First World War, Western economists had set themselves apart from politics. And what had been political economy for a hundred years officially declared itself a pure theoretical science outside of the cesspool of politics. Economic theory had solidified and separated itself from the everyday man. In the meantime, simpli simplified peanut butter and jelly versions of economic theory, theory had become part of propaganda of all the great powers, the soon to become totalitarian fascists, the totalitarian Leninists, and the governments of free market capitalists. Now, it so happens I was lucky to grow up at the dinner table where economics was still argued over. My dad was an economist. This song introduces the thesis of my presentation. It's a thesis which, for me, is intimately tied to my thoughts of Robeson. Because at the dinner table, whenever economics might come up, it was about the broken dreams of progressivism and my father trying to explain why things were not so simple. Anyway, I can leave it to the song to introduce my thesis. I gave the tune from the first part of it to my dad on his 70th birthday. It's decidedly not a song in the spirit of Robeson, rather like the old one, which is half and half, but it's more rooted in my childhood. A second here. understand the economy if not you ain't got what it takes to stay free each civilization's a living thing it can sicken and die it can grow it can sing but if brains controlled all the nourishing you bet they'd forget that it's flourishing depends on more than just Hard and lungs, stock market industry, flow of funds as they use the science of economy for social husbandry. That's the line. Cause liberty's an old political song. The right to hold our different views. Stop the music. Stop the music. Hey, did I just say liberty's an old political song? Yeah. The right to hold the different views? Yeah. That means holding elections, free elections, stuff like that. Yeah. Is it anything else? Free market capitalism. Yeah, there you got it. A thousand separate choices made all the Wait, no. It's not a thousand separate. It's not a million separate. It's everybody's 
choices made all along based on Madison Avenues. For economics tells us all the curves and facts and numbers, what it thinks are optimal and minimum needs. It lays out all the plans and charts for governmental blunders, proud of all the growth it shows for what? It's nothing but just like a farmer growing weeds. Kudzu! You ever heard of kudzu? That's a weed. That's the military industrial complex. Conspicuous consumption. <laughs> That's morning glory vines. They're covering up all of my tomato plants. Hollywood. Hollywood. Honeysuckle vines. I got a good one. Dave, stop the music here. Dave, ask me what I brought home for dinner. What'd you bring home for dinner, Bugman? The new Batman. I know. What did you bring home to eat for dinner? Six bushels of honeysuckle. Keep your mouth busy. <laughs> I got a million of them. The system is essentially an information business, planning and controlling the political economy. A cornucopia of goods and services we value. Who cares what it takes to keep it pumped? Then dumped. The mountains we don't need. It's pornological. Oh, all those aisles and aisles and aisles. Okay, okay, okay. A liberty's a value cast into law, a human right it is our due. The economy's a debt against which we draw our livelihoods without a clue. That holding it together are our mutual obligations, faith in something greater than creators of the law, the hidden hand. Nature is our governor, society's our privilege, but all that stuff about the profit motive drives our lives. It's the screwiest, scummiest flaw. Screwiest, scummiest flaw. There it is. Full participation, each of us finding roles, is the golden key to civilization's health. Old time education with citizenship, its goal will keep on covering. Nature's wealth. Gotta understand the economy. If not, we ain't got what it takes to stay free. Our lives depend on our Mother Earth. We shape her and mate her for all that we're worth. But the world has eons of her own time to patch. The mess, reclaim our crime. To arrest ourselves first, you think we might find a science of the social mind. Economics is just half the philosophy. This was the clue, actually, for the, my old, that, came, that gave me the clue that solved the old puzzle of the progressive dream. Uh, when I ran across this, I realized now I could start, te I could start telling Paul Robeson's story because I understood the 20s. The book is called Looking Backward. 2000 to 1887. It was by Edward Bellamy in 1887 and was one of the largest selling popular novels about economics, about an American socialist utopia in the year 2000. The book was sold around the world. It describes a totally efficient, centrally planned state. It's not communist. Its premise is that private corporations grew so big and greedy gobbling each other up, that they simply merged with government. And once they took on the responsibilities of caring for people, these corporation governments became supranational 
beneficent societies. It reads like a fascist dream made in Hollywood. Second, since I found this book, I've been collecting, actually buying these Eric's copies of this book for all the different prefaces. It's republished about every 10 years. In this preface, he tells us the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the National Council of Women, the Knights of Labor joined the Theosophists and the National Farmers Alliance in supplying copies to their members. Eric had a paperback version from 1887 in this bookstore. He sold it, but it's very interesting, a paperback in 1887. Lawrence Grunland, who had written his own version of A Socialist Future in 1884, ordered book agents to stop selling his books on the grounds that Bellamy had a more compelling exposition. Bellamy was translated into Chinese, Dutch, Danish, German, Russian, French, Bulgarian, Czech, Hungarian, Italian, Japanese, Polish, Spanish, Portuguese, and Hindi, and others. The novel quickly became the focus of international debate about the shape the future should take. In the novel, he says, the tendency for capital to consolidate eventuated in a single trust led by the National Party committed to reconstructing the nation as a family, a vital union, a common life. Americans then took the trust out of private hands and ran its affairs in the common interest for the common profit. No one objected because the superiority of cooperation became self-evident. That was in Bellamy's Looking Backward. And this is the 1887 edition. It's not a crazy book, but provides a detailed analysis of incredible wastefulness of capitalist production and distribution. It was an economic analysis for the masses, which is why economics was at everybody's dinner table. It was faulty analysis, but it was very convincing. And once you read it, you can understand how the hope and dream of a just world became confused with one of a scientifically planned society. And I recommend it to every smart 13-year-old who wants to talk bombastically about the inefficiencies of free market capitalism. Three great thinkers, John Dewey, historian Charles Beard, and the Atlantic Monthly edit editor Edward Weeks, in the 1920s, each independently chose Looking Backward as the second most important book in the world written in the last quarter of the 19th century. On all three of their lists, this was number one. So there you have it. The two the top two most influential books in the 1880s and 1890s represent both totalitarian temptations in the 1920s. It was Howard Lippmann who in his book The Good Society back in 1937 put his finger on the larger problem. That is, the problem as it was left to us in free market capitalism. By the 1930s, Lippmann saw that liberals on either side of the Atlantic could only grasp, grasp collectivist philosophies. And the real flaw was the problem of collectivism and planning, whether by a totalitarian regime or a giant corporate industry. Lippmann went even further in his next book, The Public Philosophy, which he wrote as the Germans were overtaking Paris, and he had just left Paris. He claims that throughout the 1800s, the ideals of free speech and private property had lost their classical entailments of social obligation, and by 1900 had become so dumbed down and misapplied that the debacles of the 20th century had to come about. Well, if his analysis was right, could we be any better off today? Could anyone have paid any attention in 1937 to this one? or right after the war when this one came out, when we had just defeated Germany and Japan. John Kenneth Galbraith, that's my next book in here, who had coordinated industrial support for the Quartermaster Corps in World War II, made it even clearer in the new industrial state in 1966. He shows how deep the requirements of economic planning 
of industrial scale and risk management reach into the structure of a culture, for there's ever-pressing need to ensure that society is going to want what industry is gearing up to produce. And the gigantic corporations and governments have to scratch their backs, each other's backs. Of course, in the 1960s, this was already old hat when Pete Seeger was singing songs like Little Boxes. But Galbraith makes another point, and this is even more fundamental. In his studies in the American workplace throughout the 1950s and 60s, he showed that the driving motive in the workplace was participation in the larger social and economic process and not the profit motive. The giant paychecks were not the driving force for growth. Galbraith is echoing Veblen, who was a famous economist from the turn of the last century, from the 1890s. He's famous for his theory of the leisure class and his recognized recognition that conspicuous consumption, which was my joke in the song, Conspicuous consumption drives a lot of the economy. Big cars showing things off. But economic theorists didn't really pay a lot of attention to these either of these reasons for as a base for economy or economics by 1910 or 1913. They were already into other things. Ah, yes, Galbraith's assertion about the profit motive. That's right. It's very interesting that the very first treatise on economics in the West was called Economica, and it's by this fellow. His name is Xenophon. He was a contemporary of Socrates. He was one of Socrates' pupils. He was a pupil along with Plato. His book, Economica, is about this much of the volume. But it's been said it's not truly in economics. It's about managing an estate, which Xenophon uses as a metaphor for a whole nation. Xenophon wrote elsewhere about financing military exped expeditions. He wrote about silver mining and trade to keep Athens alive. So he knew what economics was about. But Xenophon finds that the central value underlying all economic motives is maintaining obligations, social fellowship, friendships, and good faith. That practicing good economics is the human science that keeps us from relapsing to barbarism. Which the Greek states, even in those glorious days of Athens, knew very well. So who could care to get today? What kid could care today? Why is it still important? Well, for one thing, the boom time cycle may well be coming to an end and impacting us in our great age of recreation. Things we take for granted may no longer grow on trees. Pressures of global warming, real or imagined, will make it easier and easier to justify new measures to prop up our standard of living. We live in a world which understands control and will rationalize autocratic control just a little tyranny, rather than implementing measures espousing rational self-control to keep us from overspending, overgrazing, overdrilling, and generally continuing to rape the earth for the present generation's immediate gratification. So, I believe people may break out of their apathy and still give a damn. Of course, there's a critical problem. One, we're addicted to a good life. So we've got the problem of addiction. But the other is the extent to which we're already brainwashed into believing what is possible and what's not. Today we confuse information and control with knowledge and wisdom. The GPS devices everybody's putting in their car are a great metaphor. They tell us how to go anywhere. Though we have no idea where we are in relation to any place else, it doesn't matter. We're told in whatever voice we choose. We can program the GPS in our parents' voice, our pastor's voice, in a sexy voice of some vamp. It's our choice. If you've never used one, they're amazingly omniscient. They know it all up to the minute. Construction detours, police barricades. I was driving with one 
road that I went on just yesterday and the GPS said, turn right. That's crazy. There was a police barricade half block up. It knew it. They show you a cartoon version of the road you're driving, extrapolated from satellite pho photograph. And they'll bring you inches of the, two inches of the driveway when you're told, you've arrived at your destination. Now, who could question that kind of omniscience and believe there's more to be known than the system already knows, or that we could conceive of a better world? This, unfortunately, is our biggest problem. We've already been brainwashed to trust that what is must be. Of course, you could always read looking backwards and be reminded of how far the perfect, omniscient, centrally planned dream world has yet to go, with the hindsight that Bellamy's GPS got him to the right address in the wrong town and the wrong country. I don't know how we're going to do it, but here's the title song of my original musical. It's called Paul's Song. This is the spirit of Robeson that, got, that I got from him and I'd like to give away. It's an affirmation that a new day is still coming. Happiness needs patience and will And I'll say it loud Don't mind if I draw a crowd That there's a lot of hope around here still My rebirth day's coming up It's my resolution That I'll tolerate and go my way Won't my kids be proud can't stop crying it out loud that all our arrogance will end someday. Gonna sing my song all around the world, gonna make it ring and open our eyes. Gonna sing that song all around the world so the folks can harmonize. Gonna write my will in my song, gonna sing so clear that when I die, gonna hear my will sung around the world till the day it's realized. song gonna sing so clear that when I die you will hear my will song around the world till the day it's real I hear the words of that song and say what wishful thinking if only that were true, what kind of vigilance and hard work is it going to take to keep the real dream of humanism alive? Sir, it's an easy path right through this side. What kind of vigilance and hard work is it going to take to keep the real dream of humanism alive? Robeson matters most to me at least because he was forgotten by American culture for nearly 30 years. The system made it verboten to say his name and erased him from the memory of two generations. He was a Martin Luther King. He was a Malcolm X. He was a James Earl Jones. He was a Pavarotti. And he was all-time All-American football player wrapped into one person. And he was wiped from public memory in less than 10 years. It's truly an amazing testimony to the reality of social and cultural brainwashing. His story is the most profound instance of the system's tyranny over human minds, though we cherish the belief we're all free of it. Paul's story is far more dramatic, in fact. 
the incredible duplicity of the Soviet Union aside that no one could grasp, a system that Paul found himself in the corner with defending, but the 32 shock treatments that he received by our embassy's appointed doctors, how he was tr truly buried alive, incapacitated in his prime. If we're willing to r forget all of this and the controversy that caused it all, his politics and whitewash the story to turn him into just an important black culture hero, Paul Robeson will also be the most profound instance of the failure of progressive dream, of the progressive dream to recognize its underlying errors. That its central theme was about human rights and not the material distribution of goods and services or the good life. That it's about the liberation of man, no longer separate, alone, and isolated, but experiencing his at one with the world in which he lives. Well, we're back in a times when economics makes the headlines and is central to our daily affairs. And there's no social science, nor any agenda, or positive dream about what we're looking for and where we're going, except perhaps spreading free elections and markets around the globe, if necessary, by force. And in the days to come, when the pressures mount for justice because the cornucopia of material goods and recreational pleasures are less and less available, even here in America, the answers are going to be short-sighted and shallow. They're going to be right from the radio shock jock's mouth. Without new tools, without understanding the economy, we shall be lost. So I'm suggesting we can tell the story of Paul Robeson in, in, terms, of his, in terms of his progressive dream what human rights might still mean for all people, to come to grips with why his dream failed when it did. Otherwise, we'll never make it real for us again. To make it real, we must reopen the dialogue from the days of our grandparents and great-grandparents, when the main tenets of political economy were still up for grabs. We must begin by looking backward from 2000 to 1887 when someone could still seriously ask if we had the fundamentals down on words like interest, taxes, labor, investment, markets, capital, money, credit. Many of the constraints that bounded the original economists, from Kesney and Smith to Schumpeter and Keynes, constraints that define, constraints that define the theoretical science no longer apply. The basic relationships are all there. They're there to be learned from all of these old, these old tech textbooks. They're laid out for reevaluation, though, now. Uh, the social obligations inherent in property and production, the social obligations of energy and resource extraction, social communications in light of the information age, where mathematics, money, and markets all come together. All of this is there for today's teachers and kids to talk over again at the dinner table of their classrooms. The Internet has given us an entirely new kind of market mechanism, and a labor market that was undreamed of in the wildest thoughts of all the utopian thinkers of the past. Micro industries have turned the physical requirements of energy production and manufacturing upside down. It's time to go back to the basics and rebuild the laws that hold us together as nations, as people, as communities. Theory and possibility of engineering our world within nature's laws is an unbounded new continent for the kids of today. Kids of all ages to begin exploring all over again. And as I intimated in The Economist March, I find that I'm sort of a closet physiocrat. Physiocrat was the name that's called rule of nature. Sustainability, the constraints of husbanding Mother Earth, are bound close with what I called farming liberty. But these are just my biases. They're, no tool, they're not tools of a true science yet. When I said economics is only half of the philosophy of a true science of society, well, the other half the other half is law. The other social sciences today are in a place where today they can, they can finally inform the foundations of both economics and law. And there is a field called philosophy of law, and, and I wrote down here, when I turn 70, I'm going to put Roscoe Pound to music. They, to finish off here, 
to look at the same period of intellectual ferment before the wars, World War I and World War II. This is John Dewey's Democracy and Education. He says in it, it's 1919, 1920, something like that, 21. He says loud and clear that if a child grows up with no understanding of how our social economy holds together, we can kiss democracy goodbye. We need to take that to heart and make sure that every child begins to learn how it is we're fed and clothed, how we find houses and jobs and build our dreams within society, to understand what citizenship and participation truly are. And we can start by telling Paul Robeson's story, the whole story providing our kids with someone of truly gargantuan historical stature, a legend as fine as any in any of the classic Greek tragedies. With that kind of faith and em energy to emulate, I'll lay bets on it, we might still have some time to build the kind of world he believed in. Looking at a lake, you can calm your mind Just to think of all the dreaming done for you Of nature's kind of peace for all humankind Is a dream both deep and true You cannot count the fish from the surface of a lake So don't ever think a lake is sleeping just a sitting kind of still, very deep in thought, reflecting everything. Buzz wants here. Uh, Tom Florek and Mike Litwin. <laughs> I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Harry Jackendall. Yeah. The book man. <laughs> the book man. <laughs> 